I'm here today from the land of the Irrigandji people in Funnels, Queensland, Cairns. So I welcome you to wherever you're joining us from all over the world at whatever time of day, if it's a lunch on land, a breakfast on land, after dinner, wine on land, whatever's working for you. So the way we try to run these sessions is sort of around about 15 to 20 minutes of our we'll have a bit of a chat and a demo or try and keep it as interactive as possible. And then we have some time for questions afterwards. As Paul said, please put any questions that you may have into the chat if you like, and Paul and Joan will also be monitoring that so they can pull out any of the questions in case they get lost in amongst flows and other questions as well. So feel free to introduce yourself, let us know where you're joining from, and add in any other questions or what you're hoping to get out of today as well. So just as a bit of a precursor, just before Christmas, I, I ran a, a very short webinar, a similar lunch and learn on looking at data readiness as part of the disaster management cycle. And I think Joan will be able to pop in the chat a link for you there to that webinar if you missed that. And there's also a blog associated with that. And I wanted to follow up with, with what we've got today just letting you know how things have gone and let's let's look at some really cool data sets that we've got and see how we can access change there as well. So that's what today's about. It's very, very short PowerPoint slides. I promise I'm not going to give you death by PowerPoint and then we'll get straight into some demos. All right, so just as background, this is what we were facing in the final Queensland region just before Christmas. This is tropical cyclone or hurricane Jasper, just off the coast here, and it was bearing down on the Cairns region with a, with a plan to cross the coastline just before Christmas, sort of for, uh, around about this time last month, actually. It was an incredibly slow moving, slow moving system. We had lots and lots of time to prepare, which gave us a lot of time to get out and capture some data in areas where we were missing some data sets as well. So this is what we were looking at. And it's this all forms part of the disaster management cycle. So as Joan just posted in the chat for you there, so you can go back and review the, the previous lunch and learn if you like. I spoke about reduction, readiness, response and recovery, but particularly about data readiness and making sure that we're getting all this baseline data that we may need to help support any recovery and future reduction efforts there as well. So today, really what I want to focus on is the follow up from that. And we're going to move into effectively, we're talking about recovery and reduction. So how do we make sure that we don't get as much damage next time? What what can we put in place to keep people safe? So I am going to jump right into a bit of a case study around the data sets that we captured before and after the cyclone hit. And for those of you that don't know, it was a massive flooding event shortly after the cyclone as well. So the cyclone itself didn't cause that much damage. It was the flooding that followed because it, but the system basically sat directly above us in Cairns and it just sat there for days on end. So let's jump right in and what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the data sets that we captured before and after and show how we can do this in a collaborative manner and we'll share some other links as we go. So first of all, what I'd like to do is I might just zoom all the way out so you get a little bit more context for, for where we are. So Northern Australia up the top here and Cairns is about halfway between uh, but a little bit further than halfway between Brisbane and the tip of Australia here. So we're well set in the tropical region. So what I'm going to do first of all, let's just zoom into, into the region that I'm talking about. And actually, I'm going to jump over just to a different project here. So I'll give you a bit more of a feel of the full data sets. So let's zoom in all the way in here. And as I start to zoom in, you'll actually see some of the data sets that have been capturing not just over the, the period of the cyclone, but actually beforehand as well. So I live in this region here. So these are some of my local beaches and I've been monitoring them for a couple of years. And through the disaster readiness phase, I was compiling these data sets together to see if they were going to be useful and hopefully be useful for detecting change later. So you can see there's a range of different data sets at a couple of different beaches. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump across and really just look at 
a couple of data sets so I don't overwhelm you with all the things that you potentially can do, but just look in detail at a small subset. So first of all, you'll see that here, yeah, lots of different data sets. I'm going to jump into this area here where I have just three data sets. And here's one I prepared earlier. Here's this particular project in here. And so just reducing the overwhelm. So you can you can see that you can actually have data sets in more than one project. So this is the first data set that I captured in this region back in October 2020. You can see a beautiful, lovely beach line. We've got a bit of a creek coming out and really good conditions that day. So that data set I hadn't recaptured until just before the cyclone. And so the next data set that I'll bring up here that you'll be able to see was from the 10th of December. So this is where we, we had heard that the cyclone was coming and we started to think, yeah, okay, well, let's get out the second that we can get the best data possible. The tide wasn't as low as I would like, but it was just a case of let's get the most recent data set. And what you might be able to see here is actually we've had some infrastructure change and you'll be able to see that we've actually put in a footbridge along this area. And we were particularly interested to say, hopefully that that footbridge would survive the cyclone but interestingly, if you zoom all the way into this, and Joan will give you the link to this project later, so you'll be able to do this for yourself as well. You may be able to see, if you look closely enough, that there's a fence at either side of the bridge, and that's because the bridge hadn't actually opened yet. So it was due to open just before Christmas to pedestrians. So I imagine it was pretty high on the council priority list, but also the people who built the bridge as well, hoping that it was going to survive what happened subsequently. So what we've got here, Great Bridge, and then the 2nd of January, so after we finally got some clear weather after the flooding and after the cyclone, this next data set that you'll see popping up through here is, yes, we still have a bridge, which is fabulous, really excited about that. It's just a really good cycle route along the northern beaches of where I live. But there's considerable change in the beachhead here. So let's just zoom out just a little bit so you can see this nice and clearly. And if we have a look at the, the two dates beforehand, what you'll be able to see is that the beach line along here is really straight. So I'll just remove that top layer again so you get a really nice long straight beach line. And you'll see that that creek is now definitely in high water and, and flowing out to the sea. And there's been quite a bit of debris that's picked up because of that and that's changed the geomorphology and the shape of the beach as a whole. So we've got this tool that just allows you to swipe between any of the different layers you like. It's always kind of like opening and closing a curtain and it's really good for just looking qualitatively and having a really good visual on how things are changing. Now you can also have a look at not just the author mosaic, which is what we see on top here, but we can have a look at the digital surface model as well, which looks at where the tops of the elevation is on the tops of the trees and buildings and that. So if I turn that one on, and this time I might actually just swipe between the author mosaic and you'll see the, the elevation below that this time as I swipe. So you'll be able to see those different features. And that's one of, one of the things that we use to subsequently look at how much and really quantify that level of, of sand movement. So have we got erosion in some areas and deposition in others and where is it moving from in, in neighbouring beaches as well. So one of the things that we can do with this also is, is that we can work with our collaborators to start saying, okay, well, this, this is an area that I've captured when I've flown it, but how, how do we deal with management and, and can they give us additional information on perhaps other areas that we need to capture or areas that we think possibly need to be checked out on the ground as well. So a really good way to do this, I might just, I might split my screen here as well. So I'll show you how this works live as well. So I'll pop this up and I'm going to bring myself, I'm logged in over here into, into a, a separate account. So you'll see that I've got my, I've got my data sets in both. So I've got the project open in both windows, but just in a different login over on the right hand side when I'm in incognito. Um, now one of the things that you can do now is that if I start to say, okay, well, I'm I'm interested 
over here to add some additional information. So I might add some extra points of interest. So I'm going to add that we want to check out those areas where the gates were blocking off the bridge access. So as I add it over here, you'll see in one account, I'm adding it and it's automatically updating on the second account over here as well. And you'll be able to see my cursor moving around as I do that. So I might say as, as one collaborator, it could be the person who captured the data or maybe I'm my boss or a client that I work with. This one I'm actually going to um, label prioritize areas. Um, and point one, I might say, there's well, point three is number one. This one might be a number three priority. And this is a number one priority as well. So that way you see it's automatically updating over in another browser. And actually, if you can see my screen behind me, it's also updating over there because we have this real time connection here that allows us to see that. So we can also draw comments. So I might say, you know, drop a comment in over here to say, yep, yeah, let's check in. I'm going to check the fence here. Um, and you'll see that pop up. And if I'm the second person reviewing that project, I'll be able to see what those comments are and then come in and say it looks okay, for example. So we see those two accounts coming through and that information popping up, which makes it a really cool and interactive way that you can start to share the information with your colleagues and clients without having to email email lots of files through and then worry, worrying about checking what version you've got now as well. So as we were working through this project and I was showing some other colleagues, one of the questions they had was, hey, yeah, this is really like the beaches. We've got some great work to do on the beaches. But do you have any, any data that was captured over the main river that flooded? And so the main river that flooded here was the Barren. And they're slightly southwest of the area that I just showed you on this beach here. So let's just, just pop down here and have a look on the map here. So this is this is a main access route um, into, into town along the along this main road here. You can see in orange. And so there's an airport over to the east. So there's only a, a certain area that I'm able to capture data. But what we've got so far here is if we just have a look down in the bottom left hand side here, it actually tells me that although I don't have data sets in my projects that cover that area, there's actually five drone data sets that are available for me to use. So if I click on over to that, it's going to allow me to see what data sets are available and if any of those are going to be helpful to me. Now, ignoring the top two data sets, because they're ones that I flew yesterday, so we'll come back to those later. What we actually see here is that somebody else in the Cairns community has captured data in the region and they've uploaded it. So it's available for me to add to my project. So I'm going to crack on and do just that. I'm going to add these three data sets here into my project and then pop in and have a look and continue with the discussion that I was having with my colleagues about where to next. So one of the things that we'll see when the data sets load, we've got them over here, I'm going to zoom back into that location, and you'll see that there's actually three different data sets that I can toggle on and off. They overlap each other, and you can see a large amount of riverbed here, which if we have a look at the satellite data, looks completely different. So that's one thing that's really interesting. But what my colleagues told me was that Actually, that's part of that's really good, but there's other areas that we need to capture. So together we looked at prioritizing other areas to capture, and I'll show you the outcome of that in a moment. So basically what we're doing is we did an area like this, and we said this is one priority area missing the main road here, so we don't want to fly over the top of that. Um, we've added another area over here. And one of the things that you can do is if you're if you've got a stylus or something, it's really easy to add additional drawings in there as well. So I'm just going to show you, and you'll see it pop up on my screen here, but I'll show you how to do it on my large monitor as well. So I'll show you how we can freehand draw, which makes things a lot easier when we're, we don't have to click multiple points around the place.
So we can really simply draw freehand like that by just by holding the shift key and drawing out. You can do that with a mouse as well, but it's way cooler to do it with a stylus and you'll see that it just pops up nice here. So what you can see there is we then started to prioritize areas to capture. Now, actually add in the data sets that we did capture and talk about the importance of capturing data in the right way so we get the best value for what we're spending our time doing as well. So these top two data sets are ones that I captured yesterday. So let's add them in. Pop back into that project again. And you'll be able to see the difference between the data that I captured yesterday and the data that was captured by um, someone else in the in the community when they when they did that um, early or just after Christmas. Let's zoom back into that location. I'm going to turn off my priority areas for the moment. This one's off as well. All right, so what you can see on the, the left hand side over here is the data set that, um, that I captured yesterday. So again, we can look at doing the, <clears throat> excuse me, doing the swipe action to see how it compares to the data set below it. And you'll see that the, we had a lot of rain over the weekend, so the river is in quite high flood at the moment as well, not as bad as it was just before Christmas. But what hopefully you'll also be able to see is the importance of making sure that you capture your data in the most efficient way as well, so you get the highest quality data. So one of the things that you might be able to see with the data sets below is they're captured in three chunks, and they were also captured with a flight plan going north and south. Now this is a really big challenge when you're in when you have water in your scene because you need to make sure that every photo you capture has some feature that can be used to match for the software to create the mosaic in the first place. And when you capture data horizontally in this case with a river that runs horizontally, then you end up with many, many photos that just have water in it. And so you have issues with the reconstruction of that data set there. So I flew the other way, I flew east-west to end up with a much cleaner water mosaic there as well. Now, one of the things that I can also do with this tool is I don't have to be limited just to swiping one particular area. Let's also just pop on the satellite view in the background as well. So what I want you to concentrate on when I swipe, I'll swipe these two layers together. Have a look at the amount that we have lost of vegetation along the riverbank here. And you'll also see that we're missing a bridge along here as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and select two layers. And this time when I swipe, it'll swipe all the way across. And hopefully you can see the huge amount of vegetation that's lost, particularly on the southern side of the riverbank there. And it's really quite spectacular when you're on the ground looking at it as well. And this is a rail bridge here that sugarcane gets transported across. And so that's completely gone. Unfortunately, I don't have any before drone imagery of the area, but that's where the satellite data comes in handy as well. Satellite data is a few years old, so there could have been other, other impacts in the, in the meantime as well that we're not capturing, which is again why that data readiness phase is so important as well. So just mindful of time, I hopefully, hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of a couple of the different tools that you can start to use to look at being able to assess change or at least to detect it in the first place. And there's lots of different ways that then you, then you can start to measure any of, those, any of those things that you're detecting as well. It's really easy if you have a look on the left-hand side where I've got these polygons, you can see the size of the polygon. And again, these were the ones that I was prioritizing my areas to capture. So you can see the size of the area I want to capture. And then I can also see the, the size of the total area that I've captured as well. And I can also plug it straight through to a GIS if you want to do more advanced analysis there as well. So with that, I might just hand over to Paul and see if there's any questions that have been pop popping up in the chat and anything that I can help out with. Yep, thanks, Karen. So there's uh, just one question from Rob um, around, are we using RTK, PPK? I said, no, would these have been flown with the Autel Evo 2 Pro or Mavic 2 Pro? Um, Rob's then asked, so was that difference, difference in between the DTMs from those successive flights won't return a reliable change in terrain? Do you want to just talk on that one? Yeah, thanks, Rob. So it's a really good question. It's always a challenge with if you're flying with 
RTK being real-time kinematic or the or PPK both being post-processing kinematic GPS on your on your drones or pro processing afterwards. So the process for those who aren't familiar with what that means is when you when you go out to fly, you typically deploy ground control points or features in the area where you're going to fly and you take the location of those so you know absolutely where those locations are on ground and then you can correct your drone data to that as well. Now that's really important not only for the X, Y or the horizontal correction of your data but for the vertical correction of your data as well. So that allows you to say well this 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 point here was actually at say 60 meters elevation as opposed to what the what the drone might be assessing it might be around 70 meters or it could be 50 meters so those points that you get when you survey on the ground is super important when you want to do quantitative change from from one day to the next or to compare between different data sets one of the challenges that we find though is that it is, of course, it's more expensive to use use these systems and way more time consuming to place points out there in the environment as well. So if that's the sort of thing that you need absolute values for to, to know exactly, say, how much how much sand is shifted, the volumes and that sort of thing, then it's really important that you put those calibration factors into, into your workflow as you do this. At the moment, really what, what, I, what I've shown is how, how you start to get that information and then you can go back and really hone in on those areas that you're interested in and do those high level surveys if that's something that you need for that precision and accuracy. Hopefully that answers the question. Cool, all right, we've got another one from uh, Mike Heath. Uh, Mike says he's a Genadir user and contributor of data. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, and he's downloaded two drone image data sets pre and post Jasper. He's using Metashape and he's reconstructed both, but is getting some doming due to the data sets only using the deer capture. So the camera models aren't great. So the resulting images look good locally, it complicates change comparisons. How do you compact doming or that slowly incorrect uh, ground curvature? Yeah, again, that's another good question. I think that there's there's a range of different software, both running on desktop, but also in the cloud that will allow you to automate your, your data sets together and create those digital surface models and digital terrain models as well that have shown as products here. With all those, all the different algorithms from all the various different suppliers, they do vary. And so it really depends on the, the algorithm that's being applied in the back end to your data and how that's affecting uh, affecting the outcome product as well. So we do, we don't use Agisoft for for our for our processing here. Joan, maybe you could put the link in the chat to the article that we wrote last year. Joan and I wrote an article with um, Talitha Pell last year comparing a number of different orthomosaicing tools, both for the orthomosaics and their digital surface and digital terrain models as well. And that's an open access article that Joan will be able to find for you and pop in the chat to talk about that. But on top of that, if there are artifacts, and, and by all means, there absolutely are artifacts in any of the algorithms that you use, including the algorithms that we use as well, the best way to combat that is to have your ground control points evenly distributed around the area that you're capturing your data for, and then you can calibrate your data afterwards as well. Cool. Hey, I'm just checking in the chat as well. Um, we've got a lot of people on here, and I'm sure you've got uh, more questions as well, or maybe you want some work, some help with your drone mapping workflow. Um, there's a link there to be able to book in a time with me. Uh, to have a chat i'm more than happy to help answer some more of your technical questions show you a bit more around the uh, uh around genadir as well um and we love helping out people getting started with this uh to really work out what your workflow is so feel free click that link book a time in that suits and uh, more than happy to help um already can another uh one here from uh francisco uh, i found that flying with the direction perpendicular to the wind Will help to have a more accurate pictures and data sets. What's your what's your opinion about that? That's that's a really interesting point. I've I've actually never tried that. A lot of my work is out on the Great Barrier Reef, and my highest priority is flying in the direction that will give me the less the least glint. With, so for that, I'm interested in sun angle as opposed to wind direction. Uh, so I've not done any testing on that at all, and and I also fly in relatively low wind, so it probably wouldn't make a huge amount of difference. Yeah. I'm keen to give that a go. So yeah, maybe I'll, I'll put that on my list of things to test 
to do a compare and contrast, but you can't comment but anything. Can I just talk a little bit about when we were flying out there with the Autel and how hard it was working, just sort of pre-cyclone? Yeah, so that that was really interesting. So uh, we were we were flying along the coast. You saw the data sets that we were capturing as well, and the predominant wind was a southeasterly coming in, and so I, I had the Autel set at its max speed, which at that altitude was thirty six kilometers per. Um, the 36 kilometers an hour, meters per second, 36 meters a second, I think. Um, and as it was as it was flying in the the northerly direction, it would it would hit the hit its max speed easily along the entire transect, if you like. But as you turned the 180 and flew in the opposite direction, it was cut in half. You could really see that it it was it it was an effort for the drone to fly directly into that wind, but. It was it was stable. We don't have any issues with anything, any focus on the data sets or anything like that at all. And so, yeah, that was flying directly in, or might might be a slight crosswind there, but no no issues that that I found at all. Hey Karen, you've got a link there as well. Can you show people how to share uh, projects and chuck it into uh, the um, into the chat and show yeah. people what they've got. And Absolutely. whilst you're doing whilst you're doing that, so great to have you on here. Thanks so much. See you later. Um, so when you're within a project, you have the option to share in the upper right hand um, corner. Now you can you can have it with anyone with the link. Um, you can do whatever you like in this case. So I'm going to put in anyone with the link can comment. That means you can comment and you can view this project. Um, and then I can simply copy the link and I'll pop it in the chat for you as well. You can also individually invite people and they'll receive an email for that as well. But so let's just go, anyone with link can comment, I'll copy that, pop it in the chat. You can click on that straight away um, and jump in and, and browse around. And you, you will see that you're able to turn things on and off that doesn't affect the way I see it. You'll be able to, you'll be able to zoom in and out, move around different places. All I'll see is I see a few people dropping in now, it's anonymous people. So you have slightly less ability to do things if you're not logged in. When you're logged in, you can drop comments. Um, but if you, yeah, if you want to turn things on and off, you feel free to do that. And it doesn't impact the way the project looks at all on my end, which is a really cool way of doing that. Cool. And also as you come in, you know, you can create a free account uh, and you can access some data sets uh, from the global map and put them into a project. You can have a bit of a play uh, with a project yourself with some of those editing tools uh, that you can't see on that uh, view or comment only project. Um, you can also share it then with other people as well. Uh, so feel free, have a play with the free account um, and yeah, please do jump in and uh, jump on a call with me if you like. Uh, we've got time for one more question here from Gavin. You see, the base satellite imagery was a couple of years old, so you weren't sure of the status of the rail bridge. Can you get more recent satellite data or bring your own? Yeah, that's a great question, Gavin. Thank you. So I do know that there's aerial data that was captured by Queensland government, and that's available on QGlobe for those that are familiar with using the Queensland Globe platform there. At this stage, I haven't been able to actually get the data off. So it, Presuming I, I was able to, if I had data from another source, the way that I would do that at the moment would be to bring it into a GIS platform, so in QGIS or ArcGIS, and then I would stream the drone data into that as well. At this stage, we don't have the ability to bring other raster data into, into your projects on ArcGIS. You can bring vectors in, so bring in your shape files or GeoJSONs, whatever you like. You can bring those in and you can export them back out as well. But we don't have the ability to bring in anything other than the, the data that has been automatized as far as the raster data go. The incidentally though, in that case, the the I knew the rail bridge was there because I'm in the area all the time, but I was more interested in the vegetation and how that had thinned out along the banks or completely gone. The rail bridge and the vegetation all look perfectly intact from August 2023, so just a few months prior. Cool. Awesome. Right, well, look, we've used up our half hour. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone who's attended. Um, 
we'll stick around for a few minutes if people have got other questions that they want to come on and uh, and ask. Um, but hopefully that there was useful. Please let us know in the chat uh, if you, you've learned something, what you'd like us to cover uh, next about your drone mapping workflows. Um, but as I say, we're here if you need anything, if you want some support, book in a time with me, email us back. Uh, we love seeing and talking to uh, so many users and, and learning how they're using this data. Uh, Karen, anything final from you? No, thanks so much, everyone, for taking time out of your busy days. Really appreciate seeing you here.